So I'd like to welcome everybody in this fantastic sunny Pittsburgh day that we're having uh, to our uh, CS Colloquium series. Uh, and uh, uh, my name is Alex Fabrice. For you who don't know me, I'm the coordinator for the Colloquium. I'm present to introduce uh, Dr. Diane Lichtman, who's going to introduce the speaker. So, um, without further ado, I'm professor also in computer science, and I'm really excited to introduce Professor Lee. So, her biography is kind of up there. She finished her PhD at UMass Amherst in Nationalized Language Processing. And then, although we made her a job offer two years ago, she went to the Allen Institute for AI for a postdoc for a year. So we've been waiting a whole year for her to join us. And now she uh, showed up uh, this fall. And so we're really excited to have her join our, our department. And her work spans uh, a variety of areas in artificial intelligence, natural language processing, knowledge representation, machine learning, and from her title, you can see that uh, she'll be, I think, giving um, kind of a perspective on how she's brought these two fields together in her work, which is a um, very timely topic with common sense on, particularly with the rise of generative AI since she started on that. She got predated on the buzz about that. So. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I'm just, I'm going to talk about probabilistic common sense knowledge in language. And uh, I figured some of the audience in the talk today might already heard part of the talk. So in today's talk, I'm actually going to introduce some new things, which I think is, <laughs> it's particularly exciting for me. So let's see. And uh, yeah. So let's get started. There has been, as we all know, impressive progress in AI in the past decades. So AI technologies are increasing their deployment and impact in our daily life. And interactions between these AI systems becomes increasingly more important every day. So take this example. Someone is not able to find their phone. They ask for help. Hey, Google, can you call me, please? Google said, you sure? This person said, yes. And then Google say, OK, I will call you, please, from now on. So take this, Google gets it wrong because we never said that the word police is not usually a person's name. And adding this piece of information, missing this piece of information becomes extremely important in these interactions. So I uh, propose that the key aspect of a successful, clear, and effective interaction between human and AI systems is handling implicit information, the information that is unstated in the situations like common sense. So this is why machines need common sense in order to, for them to communicate successfully be, uh, with us. You might ask, doesn't GPTN models already have common sense? So, uh, so I asked GPT-3 this example, which one is heavier, a croissant or strawberries in the same size as a croissant? GPT-3 said the croissant is heavier. And then you say, well, I will check GPT. And ChatGPT said the same thing, but with a lot more explanations of the wrong answer, why the croissant is heavier. And then take it further to GPT-4, same thing happens. GPT-4 still thinks the croissant is heavier too. So my answer to this question is just not really. Uh, the machine still doesn't have common sense in uh, a variety of contexts. It's not as effective as human. So let's ask this question, what is common sense then? Say, so take this example, they boil the water. We as humans shared massive uh, background knowledge about water, like water is liquid, water needs to be held in a container. And this is the background knowledge that is beyond the information that is conveyed in the sentence. And the same applies for the action boil, like heat is needed to boil water and Burner can provide heat. So this is common sense, which is the implicit background knowledge that is shared by nearly all people about everyday matters. Though, but it's extremely challenging for an AI system to possess such knowledge. The amount of background knowledge we shared for this single statement is massive. And the knowledge expands drastically as when the number of sentences increase. Not to mention the millions of texts and documents we interacted with every day. 
it's imp almost impossible to store all this information in one single database. And furthermore, the useful background knowledge in the sentence like, where is the water? What tool we used to boil the water is unstated. And there are usually multiple correct answers for this kind of questions. Like cattle, pot, and glass can be all held, uh, can, water could be all in this kind of container. And then uh, we can also boil water on stove or in a microwave. Furthermore, the likelihood of these answers are different. Intuitively, we would think water is more likely to be in the kettle than the glass. And similarly, water is more likely to be boiled in the stove than the microwave. So common sense, I would argue, is also probabilistic. It provides us with a probabilistic assumption instead of a definite judgment. So this probabilistic nature makes it even harder to represent due to its uncertainty and its wide spectrum of the truthfulness of the statement. And furthermore, if we modify the statement a little bit, they boil the water and add the spaghetti, in, uh, the distribution of the answer changed even more. Now uh, the water is more likely to be in the pot than the kettle. And if spaghetti is replaced with a chemical item, the distribution changed even more. Now water is more likely to be in the beaker. So the background knowledge we apply change as the basic statement changes. Common sense is also contextual and extremely flexible, in which case it made it even harder to build an accurate model for. And in this above scenario, mentioned scenario, this kind of implicit knowledge is uh, existed everywhere. So my research focused on designing models and evaluations for massive common sense background knowledge. And this is outline of today's talk. I will start with the modeling aspect and uh, uh, introduce a probabilistic model we proposed for modeling common sense. And then the bulk of the talk of uh, today's talk is going to be on the second section, evaluation of common sense in the uh, era of large language models, which is going to be more related in today's topic, um, in today's timing. And then finally, I'll say what kind of knowledge is still hard for current large language models to have. And specifically, we name it as long tail knowledge. We created a data set and also a method of editing errors for this kind of knowledge. So let's get started for the first part. And yeah, you feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions about the slides or anything. So let's start it. As we mentioned before, we need a representation for common sense knowledge, which can model such knowledge using probabilistic abstractions and principles. And in NLP, we typically just learn a vector representation. However, this vector representation are not naturally capable of encode a full joint distribution. They rely on this a post hoc uh, like uh, normalization over vector dot product to encode a specific form of conditional probability. But and furthermore, if we look closer to these two words, rabbit and mammal, mammal is a general concept, include a lot of small concepts like rabbit. But the vector representation between these two words can't really capture the asymmetric relationships between these two. And the naive score function between like vectors like cosine uh, similarity could not capture this asymmetric relationship as well. So we can't really model the generality of the relationship and also the asymmetric nature between those two words. So we developed this representation called probabilistic box embeddings, which is naturally region based. So and could the region of the representation could represent the generality of the concept. And we can also represent asymmetric relationships between words by putting one box inside of another or using like box intersections. And we can also furthermore represent probabilities using the volume of the boxes. So to be more precise, how do we define this? Boxes are axis-aligned hyper-rectangulars. 
in the pictures we show uh, like this is a two dimensional box embeddings. And in reality, we train box embeddings with up to 300 dimensions. And the volume of boxes is calculated by taking the product of all its edge lenses. And because edge lens cannot be negative, we just apply a value function here to uh, cut out the negative values. And furthermore, as we mentioned before, the volume also represents the probabilities of boxes, of, of the concept. And the uh, unary probability is just represented by the volume of one single box. And the joint probability is the intersection of two boxes. As a result, we could easily model conditional probabilities between two concepts. So it naturally gave us this set of Venn diagram interpretation of this representation. And in this setting, in order to learn a box representation, we use a supervised training, where the goal here is to match the ground truth probabilities given at training time, and we use some sort of loss like cross entropy loss. And at training uh, time, the boxes are all initialized randomly. We train, we train them to match this target probability, which can be a unary, joint, or conditional probabilities. And for this specific task, as we can show on the left side here, we have this hierarchy that we wanted to model. And in this, uh, in this case, we just represent the hierarchical relationships as a conditional probability. So the training signal in this task is only the conditionals between, between two uh, words. At, at training time, boxes will try to match the target probability by moving towards each other. However, as we saw before, the boxes get randomly initialized. And some of them might be disjoint to start with, like deer and mammal, where the goal here is to move the deer box into the mammal box. So let's see how this uh, training goes, how, how, how to achieve this during training time if we just have this naive box training. So let's see now how the, this is the ground truth label where we have uh, the probability of deer being a mammal is one. And then let's see how the pro a conditional probability and loss and gradient change as we move these boxes. In the beginning, if, as we move deer close to mammal, because there is no intersections between those two, the probability will remain zero and loss will remain very high. And as a result, there is no gradient changing because there is no loss changing. And only if there is started to have some overlap, everything starts to change. And you might already see the problem here. It's the, the zero gradient problem. So we first uh, noticed this problem and uh, solved it in a follow-up paper called Smooth Boxes, where we take the simple strategy, just replace the maxim, uh, the value function in the volume calculation to its soft version, soft plus. And also in the paper, we show that this is similar to apply uh, to, this is approximation of applying a Gaussian convolution kernel on box edges. So here we essentially just smooth the box edges. But there can be more situations where the training gets stuck. For example, here the current uh, training is the blue box is inside of the orange one, while the goal is try to separate them out. There is no uh, gradient signals, no matter how you move the blue box inside of the orange one. So the training will still, naive training will not able to escape from this situation. More generally, same situations happens a lot in this crossing case, where if we just wanted to separate them out, but no matter how you move these boxes along the dimensions of the boxes edges, nothing will change because the intersection will be remains the same. So in 2022, we just proposed this, uh, another model called Gumball Boxes, which, where we choose to smooth the box corners instead of edges. And as you can see from the landscape of this loss function, in hard boxes, everything is uh, like have a zero or one value. And uh, uh, as we move towards two Gumball Boxes, everything gets smoothed out. Such smoothing not only like uh, makes the training possible, but it also makes the uh, 
loss continuous and also makes like every time at training updating the parameter stage, you're touching on all the parameters instead of only touching on the uh, dimensions that violates this uh, uh, conditional, uh, violates this conditional, uh, violates the condition of one is inside of another. And yeah, looking back to the previous uh, failure cases, now gumball boxes is able to escape from uh, this cases. So I'll move on to the application. Go ahead. Uh, why are you using this box in a hyperbox instead of a sphere? Uh, great question. So it's like the intersection between boxes is remains a box, while the intersection between two spheres, it's really hard to calculate. It, that makes the com computation really hard. I guess the question is, if you had used a different state, would you need to have done the soft softening or the gumballing or whatever would be the verb part of it? And I think even if it was a sphere, wouldn't that still require, because you won't mm -hmm. have a, you have a step function and you need to, uh, you know, make it into something that is not a step function. Mm -hmm. It's your bigger problem. So if instead of a box, you had a circle, for example, mm -hmm. be, that yeah. still would not yeah. change the yes. circle, right? Yes, That's, yes, yes. Is that better? Uh, that was your question, but I didn't uh, recognize that it didn't came to mind what the intersection part. So box makes more sense now. That's a good question. Uh, so yeah, are there are more questions. I can move on to the application. Uh, yeah, I will move. I uh, will talk about. I, I hope I didn't delete that slide. But here, uh, the short answer to that is boxes could represent sentences or phrases as well. But here we'll start with uh, word representation. So in this case, we're trying to word, uh, represent this word net non-hierarchy, where it contains 800,000 of edges. And they're mostly just uh, hierarchical relations, asymmetric relationships between concepts. And then the uh, training signal we have here is the conditional probability. The task we evaluated here is the generalization ability of this box embeddings. And uh, to be more specific, it's a binary classification task with 1 to 10 positive and negative edge ratio. So as you can see here, Gumball Box outperform all the other uh, methods, including Poincaré embedding, which is hyper, Poincaré embedding is uh, representing things in the hyperbolic space instead of Euclidean space, which should be uh, very ideal for hierarchical relationships. But here we show that Gamma Box is able to outperform Poincaré embedding and hyperbolic entailment coins in this, in, in this uh, evaluation. Uh, yes, and I deleted that slide, but uh, we also experimented with the sentence level uh, embedding where we represent each the entailment relationship between sentences as a hierarchical relation, asymmetric hierarchical relationship, and in boxes. So that should be like an easier asymmetric relationship between sentences instead of words. And then one thing I wanted to point out here is this uh, more recent extension of boxes called word to box where we not learning boxes supervisedly, but rather we learn boxes unsupervisedly. Similar to word to vec uh, at the training, strat uh, the training objective for word to vec is the word that appears in similar context should be similar to each other. And here is the same. The word that appears in the same context should have a bigger overlap. And as a result of that unsupervised learning, we see this, uh, that box embeddings is able to capture set theoretical semantics. Like here, we're asking the question, what is some property that is uh, not finance, but is algebra. And we compare the result between word to box and word to vec. As you can see, the nearest neighbor, I would say the word to box is much more better than the nearest neighbor from word to vec. And similar things here. What is some property that is not finance, but is chemistry? Where you can see word to vec actually explicitly outputs some concept that is finance.
I think uh, in this case, we train World 2 back in the, using the same corpus from scratch, yeah. OK, so those are like uh, some of the typical, uh, some of the representative applications of, of box embeddings. We also did a lot of following up work of trying to bo use box embeddings, modeling joint hierarchy, common sense knowledge graph, entity typing, all this uh, in all these uh, different domains. But I will talk, like, however, box embeddings has its limitations. Like, it's a really simple, yeah, shallow representation. So, but now, as we all know, the deep vector models, like transformer-based models, are showing impressive results on multiple downstream tasks. So, how about large language model? Do they have common sense? Uh, why is, uh, what kind of uh, knowledge we can, what kind of things we can get? What's the common sense representation ability of large language models? So now, let's turn to the evaluation of common sense part of the talk. So first of all, I would say uh, GPT-3, at the time of the paper's publication, did a really awesome job at uh, multiple common sense question answering tasks, even in its zero-shot setting. Like especially for this two data set, where the fine-tuned soda, like GPT-3 uh, zero-shot, is outperforming fine-tuned soda on this physical IQA task. So this really backs the question of like, do la large language models learn common sense? Do they have common sense? And in order to answer this question, in this paper, we perform a systematic study of like, we focus on the language model itself and without task specific supervisions and also without model parameter update. Really aim to answer of the question of do, lar do language models learn common sense? So in other words, just the zero shot evaluation. And this is the subset, uh, the a, a data set we covered in this paper. It includes different aspects of common sense reasoning, like physical reasoning, social reasoning, and uh, temporal reasoning. So this four data set. One thing to note is we choose uh, multiple choice. All of this data set is multiple choice data set. And in our zero-shot setting, as we all know, we just concatenate the questions and answers together, uh, get a score for each of the answer, and then take the maximum one, uh, the one with the maximum score as a prediction. And the score function here we use specifically is a token level log probability. So which language model we evaluated? We evaluated the language model from DeepMind Gopher. It's at the time the best, uh, the one of the largest, it's definitely one of the largest models that's still up to date, has 280 billion parameters, is more than 50 times larger than GPT-3, and it has like trained on a large chunk of tokens as well. So let's ask the first question, how's the zero-shot performance? Because all of this data set we checked are multiple choice data sets, you will have a random baseline. So this is a random baseline performance. And then, now we check the zero-shot performance. It's the performance is really uh, surprisingly good compared to random baselines, and especially for hollow swag and pickup. And here we even showed like the fine-tuned solar result for this data set. And these two even have a smaller gap to human uh, to like fine-tuned model compared to random baselines. And why for the rest two data sets? it remains a little bit harder. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. If this is random, should the random be the same across the different models? Oh, uh, it's because the choices is different. Like for Hollow Swag, you have four choices to choose from. And for Pika, you only have two choices. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the accuracy, just to clarify, that's the accuracy on the correct answer? Or? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. It's the accuracy on the correct answer. So then we ask this another question. How much does the performance comes only from the answers? I wish I have a way to change that. Uh, oh, it's probably fine. It's answers. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this is great. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So how much does the performance only comes from the answers? 
And in this case, we just only gave the large language model different answer choices and let the model to score the answer choices. Same as before, you score all of them and we pick the, max, the one with the maximum score. And in theory, the model should not be able to succeed when given just the answer without the question. It could be uniform and like, should be giving us result that is similar to the random baseline. However, as you can see here, especially for this two data set, the, it's not the case. The answer only baseline is performing uh, a lot more better compared to the random baselines. And the fact that they can successfully predict the correct answers without giving the question indicate the high performance in zero shot can be contributed, like at least partially, to surface cues than a deeper common sense understanding. And they also tell us like, we need a better common sense evaluation because this uh, data set may be possibly already get contaminated with the uh, model already. And then the next question is, can we have just infinite large models and uh, will the model will eventually learn common sense? Do larger models learn more common sense? So we aim to answer this question and we like, this is the zero shot performance graph of all the data sets across different model sizes. The black dots represent the model size range from 44 million to the biggest like 200 billion gopher per, uh, like uh, models. And first as we can see, yes, as the model size grows, accuracy grows. But performance plateaus, especially on this uh, final three dots, where we have all the performance uh, from different models, GPT-3, Gopher, and Megatron tuning. That indicate that just blindly training bigger models will not teach language model common sense. We may need uh, some like different multimodalities or just train them differently, not just using a language model prediction task. So this is the conclusion from this paper. Do language models have common sense? We, uh, we, we concluded that their performance is only slightly better than the than the strong story, a strong baseline, and far from state of art model, a result. And then, do larger models have more common sense? Yes, but the performance uh, plateaus at some point. And in the paper, we also evaluated few shot performance, and we find that the usefulness of few shot setting is actually benchmark dependent. It depends on your benchmark whether how much few shot helps in that case. So this is the action items we reached from this paper, uh, uh, this, this study is we should compare, always compare with a stronger baseline, in this case the answer only baselines. And we should evaluate common sense beyond multiple choice benchmarks, which is the next part of the talk. Wait, 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 can you say it again? Like which, I don't yeah. get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't do that uh, experiment in our few shot setting, but there uh, is other paper showing that if you corrupt the examples and you show in few shot, it doesn't actually affect the performance that much. The performance drops a little bit, but if you just give it a random label at uh, few shot time, the performance doesn't, it's not that uh, different. Drops a little bit, yeah. <clears throat> okay, we'll go to the next section of the talk where we should evaluate common sense beyond multiple choice benchmarks. Where we're going to lead with this uh, one paper and also, uh, there should be a animation. Okay, cool. And it's some work in progress that we're doing is automatic probabilistic evaluation for common sense frame completion. 
So yeah, let's uh, start with the older work where we argue that common sense answers are diverse and probabilistic, especially in prototypical situations. Like in this case, for, for example, here we say, what do people usually do before they leave the house for work? We have different answers like taking a shower, brush teeth, and drinking coffee. And all of these different answers have different probabilities if you ask a human. So this is the, uh, the number of people who answered this question with this answer if we just ask 100 people. So uh, 43 of them said shower, and uh, one of them, four of them said goodbye. And in this uh, data set, we collected this data set to study this uh, probabilistic nature of common sense, where we call the data set protoQA. And the questions in protoQA have multiple correct answers. And for each answer, there has a score that is associated with the answer. And in order to evaluate these multiple answers with different scores, we also prob uh, pr propose a generative ranking-based evaluation that could evaluate multiple correct answers generated by the model and also rewards the model with the correct ranking of the answer list. Also reward the model with a higher coverage of the answer list. So how do we get this data? It turns out there is this, this data is very similar to American TV show called Family Feud. And in Family Feud, you will get this kind of question, name something that's easy to trip on when you get out of the bed at night. And you will have this group, different uh, group of answers, each associated with a score. So we make use of this uh, data set. And first of all, we just went to the Family Feud fan website, did a bunch of fan, uh, like uh, scri scribe, and then get questions with answer clusters. We later did a filtering of the answer clusters, make sure the answer is not too generic, too culture specific, or too gender specific to remove bias. We ended up with nine, almost uh, like 9,700 questions with answers. And this is what the training data looks like, where we have uh, each question with different answers, and each answer have different scores. And as I said, the answer count is aggregated by taking 100 answers from different people for the same, uh, for the same question. However, for evaluation data, we don't want to just use the subset of training set because the models might already save this data online. So we created our own evaluation data. By uh, doing a minimal changing modification to the training data, to create this evaluation set. And then to get the answers, we again ask Amazon Mechanical Turk, we collected 100 answers, and then manually clustered them. So this is what the evaluation data looks, looks like. Different from the training data, we are not only having this um, different answers, but we have 100 different answers that could be expressed could, that you could express one single answer in different lexical terms, and we have all the surface form representation of that. Of that. Take a shower and showering. And this wide range of answers is what makes it possible for us to do generative evaluation. So now let's talk about the evaluation. In order to evaluate this large set of answer strings, we have, again, have this generative ranking-based evaluation that we wanted this three criteria. So how did we do that? First, given this question, we have the ground truth answer clusters. And each cluster contains uh, different surface form strings and the answer, uh, a score of how many strings, how many answer strings are in this cluster. And then we have a model prediction that is a ranked list. So the model predicted this five answers. We, do, uh, we have a matching function to match each of the answer predictions to the clusters. And then in order to, for the model to maximize the score, we also used a Hungarian matching algorithm to find the optimal matching between the model predicted answers to the, human, uh, to the ground truth answer. And then after that, We'll just, for each answer, we'll have a score. And then when you make use of this score to calculate the model performance, 
we uh, propose this two uh, metric. First one is max answer, and then the second one is max, uh, max wrong answer. Indicate, <coughs> and in both evaluation metric, we divide it by the oracle point uh, that you could have achieved in this case. So the score you get from this uh, evaluation metric is always between zero and one. So let, now let's look at the performance. At the time of the paper, we only had fine-tuned uh, GPT-2. That is the one performs the best. And then after uh, GPT-3 came out, I did a few shot, zero shot and few shot evaluation of this uh, data set and find that there's still a performance, uh, a big performance difference between human answers and uh, ground, and like uh, the model proposed answers, model predictions, especially in this kind of long tail setting where we are asking the model to predict uh, 10 answers instead of give us the most typical answer. So this setting of uh, BAM UQ, one of the things that the post does all the time is that there's a lot of different ways to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like in the breakfast, someone would say eat cereal, yeah. and that clearly is yeah. covered. Is this taken into account? Uh, in your work? Yeah, th this is exactly why we have a hundred, for the evaluation data, we have a hundred answers and uh, each answer is expressed in different surface form. Yeah. Okay, so now are there more questions? Go ahead. I think in, uh, in this case, I ask the model 10 times to let the model generate uh, different answers. But uh, there could also, like we can also ask the, uh, the model to generate 10 answers. And then I haven't, I didn't, tr I didn't report the result in this case, I think, yeah. Okay, cool. So now is, there is like some limitation of proto QA, of course. And uh, this is where it's uh, going to reach out to some current, current work that me and my student are doing. Uh, first of all, the questions only include prototypical situations. The question format is limited. We want more flexible questions. And to answer string, as Alex said, there are different answer uh, lexical uh, expressions of the same meaning, but we have to do a human a clustering. And then it's time consuming and expensive. Can we switch to automatic clustering algorithm? And furthermore, we will keep producing, saying like the probabilistic evaluation is important when you have multiple correct answers. But here in ProtoQ, we just did a ranking evaluation without taking into account of how big of a gap between my first author, uh, my first answer, and my second answer. So here we're trying to address it with a probabilistic evaluation. And where we propose here is a common sense frame completion and it's automatic probabilistic evaluation. As mentioned in the beginning of the talk, we wanted to capture this implicit information that is not mentioned in the sentence. And reasonably capture this information is useful and even necessary for all these downstream tasks. So in this case, we directly tackle the problem where we have a contact sentence like dog catches a thrown frisbee with some sort of semantic parsing, trying to figure out the sentence structure and figure out the missing components in this sentence, like who throws the frisbee. And then after I identify who throws the, like that could be a missing component, we just try to ask the question, who throws the frisbee? So of course, in order to answer the question, we need uh, human annotations. We put this into um, Amazon Mechanical Turk and get 100 answers from this. Like, Let's not say 100 answers. Let's say we get some answers from the crowd worker. And then we will do a clustering. Uh, like ideally, we will do a clustering between all these answer strings. And uh, each cluster, we will, instead of having what we had before, we will actually form a categorical distribution where each category is a, a cluster. I'm, I'm going to talk about it later, yeah. But like, but right now, a key question that we should be asking ourselves here is how many answers are enough 
to approximate the true human asset distribution. Because this distribution could be really hard to approximate. If you are just ask 10 questions, it's going to be different from what you ask 200 people. So it turns out this is a classic problem in the statistics. And there is this theorem that proves that the KO divergence between the true distribution F and the empirical sample distribution J is bounded by this equation. So this equation might seem really scary, but it's really what it's seeing is just the probability of the KL is going to be bigger than some epsilon value is bounded by this thing here. And then what does those things mean? What we really need to have here, understand here, is n means the number of samples, how many samples we wanted to draw uh, from to in the approximation as aspect. And then k is the number of categories in the categorical distribution. And finally, this epsilon value here is the KL error rate. So if we wanted to get a reasonable approximation, we bounded the error rate to be like 0.2. And we did some uh, simplification of the problem of saying the number of categories is, uh, uh, is 8, because that's what we see in proto QA, that most of the clusters is 8 to 10. After we form this graph, we will get this like, uh, nice, uh, nice plot saying here, if we wanted to have uh, with 95% uh, of uh, uh, confidence interval, and we will need, just need 102 examples for, uh, to approximate the true distribution if we wanted to have like an eight category categorical distribution. So now that answers the question, we collect 100 answers for each question. That is reasonably uh, could approximate the true distribution. So now let's talk about the probabilistic evaluation aspects. We have this uh, question, and they wanted to know what's the purpose of the boiled water. We have a crowd walker answer, 100 answers we get from human, and some model predicted answers. So what we really wanted to do is to compare these two answer sets, which could be hard for us human to do even. But what human could be doing is to cluster this raw strings into clusters that express a similar meaning. And we can match the model predictions to the similar cluster we had before. And then as a result, we will have like two categorical distributions. We can have the uh, KO divergence to compare the difference between those two distributions to accurately measure the difference between those two answer sets. So this whole evaluation process uh, means that for each answer, we will have to cluster the ground truths and match the prediction to the cluster of the ground truths and then calculate the score, which can be really time consuming. So we're trying to automate this whole process. First, we automate this by embedding the ground, by putting the ground truth answers to an embedding. So we have this ground truth answers and the model predicted answers. We'll put them all to embedding space. And here we experimented with a bunch of different embedding uh, methods. And then after we have this vector representation of them, we'll apply a clustering algorithm. And here we evaluated with three clustering algorithms, k-means, j-means, and hierarchical agglomerative clustering. After we have all of these clusters, we can match the prediction to the cluster of, of ground truth with, of course, some matching function. And uh, we also experimented with different matching functions that is both embedding based or like lexical token based, like WordNet. And then finally, we'll have uh, two pr categorical predictions that we could compare the score between them. When you connect the data, is the K defined? Uh, K. Uh, no, we don't, we don't define how many clusters there are. But from the previous data collection uh, round we saw, there is usually 8 to uh, 10 clusters. And you have to determine how many samples are Yeah. That is dependent on K, right? Yes, so yes, yes. 
Yes, yes, we just predefine. We don't. We have an upper bound of the category, uh, so we say at most it's eight, uh, eight categories. Yeah. But it's just a simplification of assumption we make. In reality, it could not be that case. In which case, we'll just need to collect more samples. But yeah, here, how does this? How do we evaluate this automatic evaluation? Typically, we'll just have a question and a large prediction set. We'll sample like unpredicted answer set, different answer sets. For each answer set, we'll have automatic uh, score that is. Uh, We'll have a human use have a human predicted score like the H scores, and we'll have also have automatic score predicted by our automatic uh, uh, metric we proposed. And then finally, we wanted to calculate the Spearman correlation between those two lines of numbers. So how does that number looks like? First of all, yes, if we have human cluster and human matching, we'll have a, class, uh, a score one. But if we change the matching part to some automatic matching function. Like here, we have WordNet, and both WordNet and embedding methods. The correlation is still pretty good. It's like 0.8. And then furthermore, and here we also compare with our previous Proto QA evaluator, where you can see a much lower performance uh, correlation score, which could be due to that Proto QA uh, evaluator doesn't take into account how big of a difference my first cluster is to my second cluster. So that aspect is not captured in the protocol evaluator. And finally, if we just change everything to automatic with a hierarchical clustering and different uh, matching systems, the correlation is still pretty decent, like, like 0.7 of correlation score. And more quantitatively, you can see here, uh, this is our, predict our uh, clustering, our uh, predicted uh, automatic score on the y-axis, and the x-axis is, is always a human score. And you can see here, ours has a pretty positive correlation with human uh, scores, while ProtoQA can't really differentiate the fine differences between clusters. Are there questions? OK, yeah. So this is the main part that we've been working on. And in the future, we are, of course, going to uh, get a bunch of model performances like GPT-2 fine-tune, T5, and GPT-4 performance. And that's something still in progress. So now going back to what we proposed. We proposed this uh, and data set and this automatic uh, probabilistic evaluation between model predictions and uh, human predictions. And we also said once we uh, confirm, like, uh, convert the problem into a distributional label, we'll face this long tail problem, where the model is having will be having problems predicting answer sets that is lies around here. And then, in order to explicitly study that part, we have two works that is sort of relate that is related where the first one is explicitly uh, studying the uncommon part of common sense, and the second one is to uh, correct the model predictions. Are there any questions before I go on? So I'm not sure if I have time to finish all of this. OK, uh, so I'll just go faster with uh, this, the last part. Where the long tail problem, uh, first you say here, this part is the common common sense. And the long tail part is the uncommon common sense. So it might feel a little bit contrived. So what do I mean by uncommon common sense? He will propose this task called uncommon common sense reasoning. You have this context of someone, OK, camera tried to eat sushi for the first time. I really dislike it. And you have an uncommon outcome, then cameras uh, we all wanted to stay and eat more sushi. As a human, we can probably come up with some reasons uh, of why this is true. So I'll stop a few minutes. If you come up with a reason, feel free to let me know. <laughs> OK. Sorry? The person wanted to. Oh, that's. That's so creative. I never thought of that, actually. Yeah, that's a really good answer, actually. But like, 
after we ask um, crowd workers, uh, the worker said, like, despite disliking the taste of the sushi, uh, they decide to stay because to avoid disappoint their partner, <coughs> who really excited about sharing. So this is a task we proposed, where it's just trying to reason about this uncommon situation by producing explanations. And this makes some outcome more likely and naturally follow the context and leave little information gap in between. Uh, and uh, I will talk about how we get the data, but for the interest of time, I'll skip that and directly to some of the takeaways we get from this work. Yeah, one thing, one uh, gist of it is for explanations, uh, to generate explanations for these uncommon outcomes, we both have large language model generated ones and human written ones. And we also used uh, large language model to modi to do some modification of the human written ones. So first of all, which, which of the explanation performs better? This is the win rate judged by crowd workers and GPT-4. The first thing you can say is the lang large language model pre explanations is actually more preferred than crowd worker. We suspect that it's because the crowd worker explanations is more uh, precise and we, it's shorter, considerably shorter compared to the large language model generations, which we'll show later in the slides. But also, but a promising thing is large language model explanations is less preferred compared to human plus LLM explanations, meaning we, uh, the combination of both gives us the best of both worlds. And then furthermore, we did some uh, analysis on how as the outcome becomes more unlikely, the language model, uh, model performance is much less preferred compared to human uh, performance, meaning that if we really have an unlikely situation, humans still performs better than, than those cases, in those cases. And then let's, as I said before, the length is different between large language model explanation and human explanation, and this is just a confirmation of that. As you can see, all the blue ones is the ones that involves human, and it's just, uh, crowd is much shorter that language model. But after you ask language model to be more specific about the crowd explanations, it gets so much longer. So length is one aspect. We also explored how much information is contained in this uh, 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 ex explanations. So this is entropy of the n-gram distribution in, this, uh, in our data set. And as we can see, this C plus LM, human plus large language model, has the most information compared to all these three things. <clears throat> and then in the paper, we also proposed a way to let smaller models uh, generate reasonable explanations as well by using imitation learning methods. And this is, uh, for more detail, we, you can just refer to the paper. We just posted <clears throat> in, on archive a few days ago. The final part is, can we if you are saying the models is making errors on a long tail distribution, can we correct them? So in this case, we frame the task in a little bit of different way, where instead of saying whether it's common or not, we ask the model if it's plausible or not. Example here is a worker needs a shirt. If it's plausible or implausible? Yes, it's plausible. But how about a chef need clothing? And the model now say like it's implausible. So in this paper, we explicitly study, can we use some model editing algorithm to correct uh, the statement, the errors that is made by a uh, model in these cases. And I might run out of time, so I can just skip this part and people can refer to the paper for more details. The conclusion is yes, we can, but you can directly apply in this previous work called Mammoth. You have to make some uh, specific changes to this algorithm in order for it to perform better in the common sense plausibility domain. And I, yeah, I can just stop for questions now. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So fine tuning in this case is uh, the okay. I guess there are two questions that you're asking. Can we uh, just retrain the model on in the for all the long tail data to make it perform better. There is a reason why this long tail because there isn't many data points out there. In terms of frequency, it happens much less compared to the head of the distribution. So it's it really hard to collect a large amount of training data in those situations for long tail knowledge, and that's why. And if you are asking specifically for why can't we for this specific task of why can't we just train this plausibility things, uh, fine tune it for the model to perform, uh, fine tune the model furthermore and to see if it can correct this or, or not. Yeah, that's a really, uh, really reasonable suggestion. But knowledge graph suffers from coverage problems, as we all know. So it really doesn't. Uh, you can always find some some long tail aspect of knowledge graph that haven't the model hasn't been trained on as well. So we really need to kind of resolve the problem uh, at the core either by having some inductive bias that is built in the model to solve the problem, like the first section of the talk of having boxes, how you can. Uh, automatically infer that if you have a hierarchical relationship, whatever things you said about the child is always true for the parent as well. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think we've been trying really hard to figure out the negative relationships between uh, words. And <clears throat> one thing that one could do is to say if you are independent, if you are not do, do not have the uh, if you do not have intersection, that means you're atonym. But that's not true. Like unrelated work can always have no intersection as well. So what it really means is the word and its atonym should. Uh, fill this whole space of probability space. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think on a similar line, we did explore using multiple boxes uh, to represent antonyms. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, but we can definitely do that. But what does the distance between uh, centers mean? I think that can be a really good idea. But I think we need to, if we wanted to represent antonyms uh, with the distance of the center boxes, I don't think it quite captures the essence of antonyms, where you have to be either one or not one. So the center, the distance between the boxes doesn't really quite capture that. Uh, in the first uh, section, uh, it's mostly we evaluated with different kind of data, either the hierarchical tree structure, WordNet tree structure. Oh, for training, it's the same. It's the same kind of training data. So in the, in the case of WordNet, it's just a pair of words and there is a mammal, there is animal, and a pair of words. And in the case of entailment, it's just two sentences whether they entail to each other or not. Uh, different probabilities of concept in the same level. I think, yes, uh, great question. It can be enforced by how many times this word appears on the leaf level or on the parent level, right? Because there is like A is B, B is C, but A is also D. So there are some like uh, how many times this concept appears on the 
leaf level, if it happens a lot, that means this, this is just the, the child of everything, and the boxes have to be a very small in order to be inside of all the other boxes. Right? So as training goes, the training data sort of gives it an inductive bias of how large or how small the boxes should be. Did you uh, evaluate like bias for the working box? And the second question is, uh, do you plan to use use that reinforcement learning for correcting the wrong spatial errors? Oh, uh, great question. I, uh, I think the second one, I haven't thought about that, but I think it should. I don't know how. Uh, yes, using RHF can be can definitely be a feasible solution. But I think you, again, I don't know how generalized that is going to be uh, in terms of the whole landscape of long tail knowledge out there. You probably can only correct this one long tail and the other long tail. How the things are, it's, uh, how, how the performance is going to be uh, for the whole landscape of long tail knowledge, I'm not sure about that. But I, I think that's definitely something that people should try to do. Uh, for this first question, did I evaluate bias in word to box? No, we did not. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Uh, I don't. I don't get it. How to use the retrieval system to update large language models, or is, does the model has to be starting with a retrieval-based language models I mean, like to start with? Yeah. 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 I, I, I thought GPT four just uh, openly I just sort of retrain their model in a in a way to add more data set. I don't know. I think this editing uh, aspect is really really interesting. I think this should be a really because this method itself is really easy to use and it doesn't take much time to edit the knowledge. And furthermore, we show that after you do the editing, the uh, especially, I guess, especially for common sense, you don't want to, you don't want to connect your neighbors to change and you don't want the, uh, the other knowledge that is dependent on this knowledge to change as well. Or you wanted the affected ones to change, or you wanted the unaffected ones to not change. So this is actually once you added that one single statement after you evaluate all with all of the other things, it's performing real uh, relatively well. Does that make sense? So and it's just really, it's more achievable than retraining the model again with the updated data, I think. But again, yeah, we can't really do this on open AI models because they're not open source. But it would be interesting to say it for the, for the other larger open source models. In this paper, we only did it for GPT-2. And GPT-2XL is the biggest we go. It, it does to some extent, but we actually show that it's not that uh, bad because here we evaluate both. <clears throat> we, 
what's the performance of correcting incorrect statements to correct statement, and what's the performance of uh, converting correct statements to incorrect statement. You wanted to minimize that and maximize that. I mean, it's not perfect. You are not going to uh, get 100 on both of them, but it's performing uh, fairly well. Yeah, so we try to increase the efficacy, decrease the relapse, and also make sure the nearby and connected knowledge is not getting influenced by whatever things you're editing. There are no more questions, let's thank uh, Lorraine.